Hello, it's Scott Manley here. This is Space Shuttle Atlantis STS-37 back in 1991. And this is kind of a follow-up to my previous video on shuttle navigation. This shuttle has the distinction of missing the runway. Okay, technically it landed short of the runway. And even then, technically it was on a runway. But regardless, this was the one case where the space shuttle landed successfully but it didn't actually make it to the target runway until it was rolling out. And I want to tell this story because, well, Wayne Hale, who was the flight controller on this mission, published a great article about it a few weeks ago, and it is a great story. So rewinding a week or so to the launch, STS-37, its primary mission was to launch the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. That was one of the four great observatories that the Space Shuttle was to launch. Hubble Space Telescope was, of course, the first and the most famous. And at this point in time, one of the more infamous, because at this point they had realized the mirror was the wrong shape. Also part of the great observatories was the Chandra X-ray Telescope. Again, a storied launch, which I've talked about in the past. And finally, there was the Spitzer Space Telescope, an infrared observatory, which only just stopped operating back in uh, 2020. During the deployment of the telescope, the antenna didn't uh, deploy itself correctly, so there had to be an emergency EVA. Of course, they had trained for this, they didn't expect to have to do it, but they were ready. In fact, the astronauts were heading down and pre-breathing oxygen before the official order came up from NASA, because they knew that this was coming after the various attempts to release the antenna had all failed. But another thing that was inevitable was landings. With the space shuttle, you could definitely delay a launch for all sorts of reasons, but once it was in space, the clock was ticking, resources were uh, being consumed, and at a certain point, landings were no longer optional. Now, because the space shuttle landed like an aircraft on a runway, it had to contend with the winds, and there were limits on what kind of crosswinds that it could handle. At this point in the shuttle's career, it was permitted to handle crosswinds up to 12 knots. Later, they would raise that to 15. Now, by crosswinds, this means the wind's going sideways across the runway. So if, if the wind is coming at 90 degrees to the runway, it couldn't be faster than 12 knots. So that's about 14 miles an hour or 22 kilometers per hour. Now, that's specifically the crosswind component. So if the winds are blowing straight down the runway, like along the length of it, there's no crosswinds. If they're blowing, say, 30 degrees off, then you can cut their speed. You know, you take the sign of that value and you that gives you half of the speed. So a 24-knot wind blowing at 30 degrees to the runway is a 12-knot crosswind. Get it? So anyway, that's one of many constraints. And they wouldn't take off if they knew that there was no acceptable landing sites because a space shuttle might get dumped into space and have the toilet fail and have to come home within 24 hours. And I'm not joking. Like, the toilet was considered a critical part of the, the spacecraft. And if it failed, then the crew didn't want to be pooping in bags for the rest of the mission. So anyway, the shuttle planners, they're looking at the weather all the time. Three days before the expected landing, they have to make a decision as to what is the most likely landing site based upon the weather. And they had a problem. The crosswinds for all the landing sites were suddenly uh, out of spec for a shuttle landing. In Florida, the shuttle landing facility was going to have low clouds. It was going to have winds that were in the wrong direction. White sands, similarly, weather was not going to work. But in, uh, but Edwards, it was going to be nice, clear skies. The winds were going to be a little high. The problem was the winds were going to be in the wrong direction for their primary runway, runway four. But at Edwards, they also have the Rogers Dry Lake bed. And this is basically a nice big flat surface. And they've painted a bunch of runways on it in different directions. So if the main runway wasn't usable for winds, it was possible one of the other ones would be, assuming the lake was dry and it was coming out of the winter, it was actually still pretty wet. So while a team was getting set up to handle a landing at Edwards, the Air Force geologist had to go out and verify that the lake was sufficiently dry that it could handle a space vehicle coming down. And just an interesting aside, on the left here, this is the diagram that Wayne included in his article showing the layout of the various runways. And I've highlighted the runway uh, which is, was used by the space shuttle, right? Runway four. Now on the right, that is the airport diagram for pilots that are flying into uh, Edwards Air Force Base. If, if you are allowed to do that, and if you know how I can get to do that, you will be my best friend. But 
yeah, these two runways are the same runway, except in the modern diagram, it's runway 5, and in the old one, it's runway 4. And sure enough, if you look at the satellite photos, you can see 04 in 2018, and in 2021, it becomes 05. And the reason for this change is that runways are marked in magnetic north, and the north pole moves around. So back in the 90s, the bearing was at 44 degrees. And so for the runway name, you divide that by 10 and round it off, and you get 04. Whereas in the new one, it's 46.5, so that rounds up to 5, runway 5. So anyway, the winds were predicted to be sort of out of the north and runway 33 was going to be their runway of choice. Except that runway 33 had never really been considered as a choice previously and none of the shuttle pilots had trained in the shuttle landing trainer. You know, the, the jet that they would fly with the gear down and the thrust reversers on to make it drop like a brick that is the space shuttle. They had never flown onto this particular runway. The charts that they had in space did not include details about this. But in the whole of the US, this was going to be the only runway the shuttle could land at. And so flight director would have to make some hard calls and for the first day, it was easy. The weather was just way too out of spec, and they had plenty of consumables, so they waved off. But the second day, well, pressure's mounting, the weather's getting better, and it might not be acceptable the day later. So the decision is made to start prepping runway 33. And one of the problems is that it's just coming out of the winter. The rain has kind of washed away a lot of the paint, and there simply wasn't time to repaint the runway to make it easy for the pilots to see. The team on the ground would need to move the lights, right, the landing aids, the papi and the ball bar system to the new runway. They didn't have time to move the microwave beam light, uh, scanning system. And while the crew in space couldn't train for this, they did get astronauts up in the shuttle training aircraft to have them attempt approaches against this particular runway to see whether it was acceptable in its current p uh, condition. And they'd said, given the other options, it was acceptable. So anyway, the day of the landing rolls around. The crew get up early hoping that maybe the weather will clear at Kennedy and they can land there. No such luck. So they're now looking at uh, Edwards and they're starting to collect meteorological data. One of the important things is, of course, the wind. And the wind is great. It's straight down the runway, 12 knots gusting to 18. But it's not just surface winds. The winds go all the way up through the air column. So they would deploy these meteorological balloons and they detected that as they got high, the winds got wild. Now, you might have noticed these two markings on the runway earlier. These are the aim points the shuttle's supposed to use. The one at the bottom is the normal aim point. That's where you would have your papi lights and you would want to see two or four illuminated to know that you are on the correct glide slope. But if something hadn't quite worked out and you were running out of energy, then you would use the second aim point, the one slightly closer in. It's a thousand feet between these, and that gets you a thousand feet closer to the runway threshold. Now, in this runway, it doesn't look that bad. It's still a dry lake bed, but if you look at runway four, it's clear that these aim points are on the other side of a road. The normal aim point is seven and a half thousand feet away from the runway threshold. And on a normal shuttle approach, you, you aim towards that first aim point from 12,000 feet, descending 20 degrees. Once you get in a certain range, you pull the nose up and you're aiming at a one and a half degree glide slope. You flare and you're supposed to touch down two and a half thousand feet past the runway threshold. So these are 10,000 feet away from your landing point. But because of the winds, they were going to end up a little short. So you aim at the second aim point and you immediately get a thousand feet closer to the target. But the other thing you could do is simply not land. You can carry your speed further across the threshold and then touch down at a slightly lower speed and therefore extend your landing point. So the normal touchdown speed is over 200 knots, but uh, shuttle rules allowed them to slow down to as little as 185 knots before touching down. So as the clock is ticking down, they're launching balloons and they're getting progressively worse and worse margins on this. Initially, the predictions show an 1,800 foot past the threshold, and later what, they show 1,300, and finally improves to about 1,600. But also, simultaneously, the shuttle training aircraft has been up and they're flying simulated approaches, and they the last report they give is that they had a simulated touchdown spot of 100, or 1,600 feet past the threshold, which was within the limits, and they gave the go-ahead to begin the deorbit. 
And, you know, there's 40 minutes between performing the deorbit burn and actually arriving at the landing site. And in that time, things changed, specifically the wind. So we talk about wind shear. That's where different altitudes have different wind directions and speeds. And there was a lot of wind shear on this. Originally, they were expecting the, a wind shear around uh, 13,000 feet. And that was going to affect their landing circle. So they compensate for that. But yeah, when they came down, that had dropped down to 10,000 feet. The consequence of all this is that the guidance initially sent them on a wider uh, heading alignment cone. That's where they do a, circle, a descending circle over the end of the runway so that they can actually line up at the correct speed and altitude. Well, they went wider and so lost a little more energy. And because the wind shear was lower down, the computer didn't realize that they were actually further from the runway with lower energy because it expected the winds to remain the same. And at some point as they're descending, the, the computer starts telling them, uh, you actually need to pull up a little because you need to fly a higher lift trajectory to get yourself to the runway. And, and the astronaut is sort of gently responding to this, but the computer's really telling him, no, you need to fix this now. So the shuttle is descending on this 19 degree glide slope towards the aiming markers and it wasn't really compensating. Normally, uh, the shuttle has a speed break which opens up so that it arrives at the right speed, but it was too slow. This was fully closed. The commander transitions from the steep descent into the shallower descent into the flare and he is just holding the shuttle off the ground until he can get as close to the runway as possible, exchanging speed for lift. He touches down at 157 knots. That's not the slowest in the space shuttle history, but it's very slow. But more importantly, he was 600 feet short of the threshold. And in a way, they're lucky that this actually happened on the lake bed because the threshold was just an arbitrary line they had drawn in the sand, so to speak. And even on the concrete runways, they would technically have been okay. The designers had added margin upon margin, and on their 15,000 foot runways, they also included an extra 1,000 feet thresholds. You're not supposed to land on this. Sometimes they're there for like uh, obstruction reasons. Others, because the runway simply isn't strong enough to support a landing. So despite landing short, STS-37 was still safe. It was successful. Uh, but the mission planners looked into what were the contributing factors and lived and learned. And one of the things they realized was that the shuttle training aircraft astronauts that had been doing the test runs, they had recognized the wind conditions, but they hadn't really communicated those to the rest of the team. And if you want more detail on this, I highly recommend going and reading Wayne Hale's blog. He was a flight director. He knows his stuff. He tells great stories. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>